What inspired you to become oh, a paleontologist? Oh, what inspired me to be a paleontologist? Uh, the, 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 the answer is a very strange answer, and I will tell you why. Uh, building inspired me. Building. Uh, I grew up in Africa, so we are not as lucky as you guys. We don't have prominent scientists come to talk to us like uh, you guys have the opportunity today. So I didn't know much about paleoanthropology when I was maybe your age. But after I studied, I finished college, I did geology. I was assigned at the National Museum of Ethiopia and my office was full of bones that came from the Lucy site. So I was spending hours and hours and hours just sitting there. So the building and the fossils that were in that room inspired me to be a paleontologist. So it was not a single person, but it's the, the fossils themselves that inspired me to be a paleontologist. Thank you for your question. Um, what makes like the findings of a baby skeleton so unique? The findings, uh, finding a baby skeleton, her question is what, what, what's unique about discovering a baby skeleton? And this is really a very important question. I do, don't have it here, but when it was published uh, a year and a half ago, it was on a cover page of the New York Times, Washington Post, and many famous newspapers and magazines, including the National Geographic. And the discovery of infant individuals is unique because, first of all, they don't make it to the fossil record. Why? Because, first, when they live, they are prime candidates of the predators, so they are butchered by the carnivores. Second, the scavengers. And third, even if they escaped from the scavengers, their bones are not fully fused. They are very fragile. So they break very easily. So it's a combination of this that they don't, they don't make it to the fossil record. So once you have them, however, not only do they tell you about the, 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 the infants, but they tell you a lot about the adults also. Because as you see, this individual has 44 teeth in its mouth. An adult would have 32. But the fact that you have both baby teeth and adult teeth in the same mouth captures a unique moment in the individual's life history, but also the species to which she belongs after the Pithecus afrans. So that's why babies are unique in the fossil maker. Thank you for asking the question. How do you know some of the features like body hair? <laughs> body hair. Uh, as I told you earlier, the good thing about working on bones is that you can go deep in time and track how things were changing through time because they fossilize. However, and unfortunately, soft, the soft, soft part of the body, including the hair, does not make it into the fossil record. So, if you saw a hair implanted in any of these individuals, it's just an artistic impression of the artist. Scientifically speaking, we don't know. And saying I don't know is a very common thing in science. Actually, it's not. It's mostly we say I don't know. And that is the motor of science. Thank you. How do you know it's 3.3 million years old? Very good question. We know because the, you, you know about radioactivity, right? So we use a method called argon argon. In other words, we measure the time period when that specific sedimentary rock was formed. And you can do that using the radioactivity method. So the age of the, the individual is the age of the sediment when she was buried. It could be plus or minus 5,000 years, but in 3 million years it doesn't mean anything. So we know thanks to the radiometric methods of argon, argon, or potassium argon -related. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, I was like, yeah, I think we can
Closer, closer. You can make it. Uh, uh, very, very, very good question, but still uh, we don't have the answer. There are some works showing that it, it might have been shorter than in humans, but that is an inferential conclusion. We infer from the fact that in humans it's slightly longer because we have this care, we have all this technology, we have the family, everything. But it would, have, it would have been a bit shorter in this ancient species. But the answer, the scientific answer would be I don't know. But it would have been shorter. I don't know exactly how much or how many, how many months. But it's a very good question. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the area in which you found Lucy's baby? Because I don't understand that it wasn't really simple for you to um, like get into that area because there were like conflicting tribes and stuff like mm, that. Okay. Very good. Uh, you've read something. Right? <laughs> okay. uh, yes, the area I worked at and uh, where I made the discovery is very remote and hostile, pretty hostile, and then also there was no access. Actually, to go to the spot where she was discovered, I made the road myself with the help of the locals. So using shovels and picks, I made the road. So it was it was not fun. It was exciting, but it was not. Wasn't fun. So, uh, yeah, it's a very difficult place to work at, and there is nothing, no village or no no camp that is permanently staying there. So I basically carry uh, a village with me when I go there. All the tents, the food, and everything from the capital, at least uh, When I made the discovery. Uh, I was the only scientist in the field, accompanied with some locals from Ethiopia. Uh, so, in short, the, the place is very, very harsh. And um, you speak the language, so it's not really hard for you to communicate with people. Actually, I don't speak the language. You don't? Language. Is that <laughs> because, what you have the locals with you? Yeah, because in Ethiopia there are over 70 different languages, 70. I speak three of them, but I don't speak, I don't speak 70 of them. But of course, it helps if you're from there, it helps. Thank you. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, I want to ask I'm enjoying you. it, actually. Huh? I'm enjoying this. Me too. Uh, I want to ask you two questions. My first question is, are y'all hiring? Uh, <laughs> hey, well, um, my, my real question is, though, um, how do y'all just go out, how y'all just pick areas to go find these discoveries and stuff? How y'all just, okay, we're gonna start here, start there, I mean, how y'all do that? Very good question. When I showed you that image where there was nothing, that's waiting for you there. But before we go there, we use satellite images, aerial photos, to actually see if there are potential sediments. For example, you don't go there if there are just volcanic, rocks and basalts. You cannot find fossils in basalts. And if it's metamorphic rock, you don't go there either. Because it's so odd, so transformed with the temperature and pressure, you don't find. So you first of all identify sedimentary rocks. So with that information, based on the satellite images and aerial photos, in addition to the reports that are coming from the geologists, who work there not for the fossils but for the mining or the petroleum, they report on the geology of the local area. So based on those three informations, you go and start to look around. So once you find an indication that there is some fossil indeed, you concentrate on that specific area and continue. And once you find something like that, then you spend four years on that just one spot. I mean, water, I mean, it's dirt. Yeah. Just, I mean, how? Yes, I know. <laughs> Thank you. I will thank you very much. We get a round of applause.